The last major topic we need to cover uh, for this unit is inverse functions. First we need to learn what an inverse function is. Then um, how to work with some inverse functions, some properties of inverse functions, and also how to obtain an inverse function. So first, you know, definition of an inverse function. There's a couple of ways we can do this. One is just sort of a full more formal definition that has to do with uh, composition functions. So uh, let, if we look at this, let f and g be two functions such that f of g of x equals x for every x in the domain of g and, that's the key, and g of f of x equals x as well. So what this means is when I do the composition of these two functions, f and g, no matter which way I do it, I'm going to get x in each case. So if I do f of g of x or g of f of x, okay, I'll get x in both cases. Now normally it's not the case. When you take a composition, we saw this previously, if you take a composition and you switch the order, usually you don't get the same thing. But for inverse functions, if I do the composition between these two functions, and no matter which way I do it, g of f of x or f of g of x, I get x, then g is the inverse of f. Or we can go op opposite way and say f is the inverse of g. Well, if g is the inverse of f, we have this notation here. We would replace g of x, remember g is the name of this function here, g with this f inverse notation. Now you see this negative 1 here. This negative 1 is not a negative exponent. Okay, It is purely a notation. If I write f inverse of x. This negative 1 is not an exponent, it is purely a notation. And I'm going to replace g with this f inverse, okay, to show that g is the inverse of f. I could do it the other way too. I could say f is the inverse of g, and I would write that as g inverse, right? And that's what I would replace f with, okay, because f is the inverse of g. Now, Okay, that's all well and good when you look at it and say, okay, if I do the composition between two functions, I'll get x. But that doesn't really sort of describe what inverses uh, are all about. So to really look at what inverses are all about, we can go back to our old uh, mapping picture. So we have set 1, set 2. This is our domain, this is our range, and we have a function that goes from here to here. This is our function. So we can think of these as independent variables, dependent variables. Uh, we can say domain and range. And typically, we think of them as x and y's. So we take this function, and it brings us from here to here. What the inverse does is it brings you back to the beginning again. You start in what was the range, and you go back to the domain. That's what an inverse really is all about. It's taking a function and going backwards, because really a function only goes in one direction. right? A function goes from the domain to the range. And the inverse function takes you back again. Well, if this is where we start for the inverse, and this is where we end, then this is the domain for the inverse. And this is the range for the inverse. Okay. And if you look, that's the opposite of what the domain and range for the original function are. What was the domain of the original function is actually the range of the inverse. And what was the range of the original function is actually the domain of the inverse. But this gives you a clearer picture of really what an inverse function is all about. Now there's a problem with this, and the problem with this is that not every function has an inverse. So if you look at this, okay, here's a function. Here's one, two, three values in my domain. Here's one, two values in my domain, in my range. So this goes here, 
this goes here this goes here okay and I say is this a function is this direction a function does every one of my values in my domain get matched to exactly one value in my range well this one goes to one this one goes to one this one goes to one so yes this is a function now the question is okay if I go back again is this a function as well if so then it's the inverse well this one goes back to one however this one goes back to two so it needs to follow a function going backwards because your inverse is an inverse function so if this isn't a function going back then the problem is this thing doesn't exist because it's not a function this one value here goes to 2 and that's the whole thing with functions remember 1x goes to exactly 1y whichever one you call x doesn't matter one starting value has to go all the way back to exactly one ending value so there are some functions that don't have inverses and some do the ones for which this definition holds do have inverses and when f of g of x doesn't equal x or g of f of x doesn't equal x okay then they're not inverses or they don't have an inverse so that's something we need to look at here are two functions that are the inverse of one another to show that they're the inverse of one another there's a couple of ways to do it just based off the pure definition we could do the composition between these two so if we look at f of x to be x plus 2 and we look at g of x to be x minus 2 so f of g of x well g of x is x minus 2 so I have to find f of g or f of x minus 2 well if I'm plugging x minus 2 into f I have to plug it in for x so I do x minus 2 plus 2 the 2's cancel and I just get x so f of g of x is equal to x alright now let's look at the other way of doing it flip the order I'm going to do g of f of x well f of x is really x plus 2 so g of f of x is g of x plus 2 so if I'm plugging x plus 2 into g I have to plug it in for x so I get x plus 2 minus 2 well the plus 2 and the minus 2 will cancel and I just get x so f of g of x equals g of f of x which both just equal x if that happens then these two functions are the inverse of one another and that just sort of makes sense in terms of the picture I was describing earlier one function goes this way the other function goes the opposite way well you're using an operation to go one direction right if I'm using x plus 2 to go this direction to go backwards I have to undo that operation so like if if 2 is going to go to 4 or 3 is going to go to 5 okay by adding 2 to go that way to go backwards I should do the opposite which means I should subtract 2 so 5 would go back to 3 and 4 would go back to 2 by subtracting 2 so largely your inverses are going to have to have the opposite operation in order to go backwards but remember what I said a second ago is that not every function is going to have that ability in that yeah the opposite operation takes you back but it still has to follow the definition of a function each value that you start with gets matched to exactly one value that you end with one thing we want to look at is the graph of an inverse for the graph of an inverse function it's got to be related to the original function somehow if you think about we, we constantly go back to this picture okay 
one function goes one way, one function goes the other way. This is my domain, this is my range for my original function, this is my domain, this is my range for the inverse. Well, if we think about these as the x's and these as the y's um, for the original function, so when I put my graph together, x's and y's. Well, for the inverse, these are my x's and these are my y's. Wherever you start is the x coordinate, wherever you end is the y coordinate. So if we think about that this way, the inverse has the exact opposite x and y coordinates as the original function, which means if we look at some point AB that's on the graph of f of x, then that reversed point BA is on the graph of the inverse. Now, what does that do graphically? Well, what happens is that if I'm going to switch around all my x's and y's, the graph of f of x is going to be reflected about the line y equals x. We've reflected things along the x-axis, we've reflected things along the y-axis. Now, this is going to reflect my graph along the y equals x line, which remember is that identity line we talked about earlier, and it's the 45 degree angle line that goes through the xy plane. Now, why is that line the reflection line? Okay, this line right here. This is this y equals x. Here's the x axis, here's the y axis. Why is everything reflected along that line? Well, think about it. The points on this line have all the same x and y coordinates, like 1, 1, or 2, 2, or 3, 3, and so on. So if I flip any of those points around, they'll be exactly in the same spot. However, if I take some point over here, um, so say, I don't know, uh, 1, 0, if I flip that along, uh, or if I flip that point around, I get 0, 1, which, if you think about it, is a mirror image around that line. And that's going to happen to every point. Any point that's over here is going to be flipped over here. So if I build a graph on this side, and I take all the points on this graph, and I flip all those points around, I want to get a graph on this side. Okay. So if we look at two functions, based off of my previous um, explanation, I think you should see that f of x equals x minus 1, and the inverse would be x plus 1. That's the whole opposite operation kind of deal. So if we look at the two graphs of these things, okay, the first one, x minus 1. This has a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of negative 1. So I get a y-intercept of negative 1 and a slope of 1, which means I go up 1 and over 1. So I get this point. So this is my one line. Look at the other one. This has a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of positive 1. So I go, okay, uh, y-intercept of positive 1, slope of 1, up 1, over 1. I get this point. This is my other function. So this is f. This is f inverse. Okay. Look at the symmetry between those two graphs. Look at this line right here. This y equals x line. These two graphs are symmetric to one another along that line. What I mean is if I folded my paper along this line right here, this piece here would match up with this graph here. So they're mirror images along that line. That should always happen for two functions that are the inverse of one another. If these functions are the inverse, their graphs are symmetric around this identity line, this y equals x line. All right, now that we learned a little bit about inverse functions, we need to realize that not every function has an inverse, as I sort of described earlier. So which functions have inverses and which ones don't? Well, it's all about this function called a one-to-one -one function. So let's look at x squared, y equals x squared. If I drew y equals x squared, I should get a parabola. Okay, looks like that. That's not the best picture, but that's what a general x squared looks like. Now, if I reflect that along the y equals x line, okay, what's going to happen is I'm going to get 
choose a different color as so I'm going to get this picture now one way to see if a function is one-to-one -one is to take that function reflect it along the y equals x line and then see if its reflection is also a function well if you look at this thing here is this going to be a function well how do you know if a graph is a function vertical line test if I do the vertical line test on this reflection this blue graph it doesn't pass the vertical line test and therefore it's not a function so if the reflection of y equals x squared doesn't pass the definition of a function then y equals x squared doesn't have an inverse it's one of those functions that's not one-to-one -one. so we need to talk about one-to-one -one a little bit more than just looking at the graphs but what is a one-to-one -one function well a one-to-one -one function can have a bunch of different definitions but the key to it is this if f is a one-to-one -one function then each value of the dependent variable corresponds to exactly one value of the independent variable now that's a lot you know but what it basically means is that you have the defini definition of a function in two directions that each x gets matched to exactly one y if I go that way and each y gets matched back to exactly one x if I go that way so I have a function going in this direction and I have a function going in that direction if my function is one to one then that function will have an inverse now this if with two f's that you see right here I did not spell that wrong that stands for the words if and only if which means it's an if then statement that goes in two directions if a function has an inverse then it's one to one or if a function's one to one then it has an inverse it goes both ways which is a lot of what functions do right they go both directions well this is a statement that goes both directions and an if and only if statement goes both directions if this was an if with one f it would only go in one direction uh, that's probably more than we really need to cover but that's what the if with two f stands for if and only if but the the key to this one-to-one -one function thing is that you have to have a one-to-one -one function to have an inverse y equals x squared does not have an inverse y equals x squared is not one-to-one -one. okay so we need to check to see if functions are one-to-one -one. one way is to graph them but that's not usually the fastest or easiest way to do it there's another better way to check to see if a function is one-to-one -one. and think about how we check to see if something was a function if we looked at a general equation and we wanted to determine whether or not it was a function we solved it for y and when we solved it for y if 1x got us 1y it was a function well if we want to see if it's a one-to-one -one function we'll just solve it the opposite way solve for x so y equals x squared this is solved for y and I could check to see if this is a function which we already know it is by saying okay since it's solved for y if I plug something in for x any value in for x well I always get one value for y well think about it. if I plug any value in for x what am I going to do to it square it if I square any single number I always just get a single number answer now some X's will get me the same answer like if I plug negative 2 in or positive 2 in I would get 4 but that's fine one X that I plug in if I plug this one X in I'll get one Y for that If I plug this one X in I'll get one Y for that they happen to give me the same Y but that's fine so each X I plug in gets me one Y this is a function and by solving for y we see that best now if I want to see if it's a one-to-one -one function what I want to do is solve it the opposite way and make sure that for every one y I go back to one x so if I solve this equation for x so I want to get x equals well in order to do that I have to get rid of the square you get rid of the square by taking the square root but remember whenever you take the square root of both sides you need to have your plus and your minus there are two values there 
that the square eliminated. So when you eliminate the square, you put those values back again. So x equals plus or minus y. Now if I look at that, if I plug one value in for y, do I get 1x? Well, the answer is no, because if I plug 4 in for y, I will get negative 2 and positive 2 for x. 1y does not go back to 1x. One dependent variable does not correspond to one independent variable, and therefore this is not 1 to 1. So the best way to see if something's not 1 to 1 is to solve the equation the opposite direction. Instead of solving for y to check to see if it is a function, then solve for x to see if it's a 1 to 1 function. This brings us to the horizontal line test. A few moments ago we looked at taking a graph flipping it over the y equals x line and seeing if that resulting graph is a function. That was a method of determining if we had a one-to-one -one function, but you can do something much easier than that. We have something called the vertical line test. The vertical line test tells us whether or not we're looking at a graph of a function. Well, if we then want to also determine whether or not what we're looking at is a one-to-one -one function, it should first pass the vertical line test, make sure it's a function. Then if we pass what's called the horizontal line test, we can determine whether or not it's a one-to-one -one function. The horizontal line test works basically the same way the vertical line test did. If every horizontal line the, that meets the graph of the function hits the graph at at most one point, then the inverse of this function will also be a function, essentially meaning the original function is one-to-one. -one. If you take a horizontal line and you put it anywhere on this graph and you hit more than one function, okay, or more than one x value, then um, you're not going to have a one-to-one -one function. So just to clear this up, let's look at these two graphs. You should know what this function looks like. What kind of function is that? It's an absolute value function. And what's the shape of an absolute value function? V-shaped, okay? So if I look at this V-shaped, if I put a horizontal line anywhere on this, do I hit two or more points? The answer is yes. All over the place, right? Two points, two points, two points. If I hit two or more points, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, and therefore it's not one to one. Okay. Let's look at x cubed. You should know what the graph of x cubed looks like. It looks like that. And the question is, okay, is this a function? Yes, passes the vertical line test. Okay, I put a vertical line anywhere on here. Yeah, it's a function. But is it a one-to-one -one function? Well, put a horizontal line anywhere on the graph. Do I hit one point? Yes. Do I hit more than one point? No. So if I only hit one point all the time, then this is a one-to-one -one function. So x cubed is one-to-one. -one. So this is the one quick way of determining whether or not functions are one-to-one -one if you know how to put the graph together. If you don't know how to put the graph together for certain functions, then the best thing to do is to solve for x. So now that we've seen what an inverse is, we've seen some properties of inverses, and we've seen which functions actually have inverses, we can now try to find an inverse for a particular function. So these are the steps that you're going to want to follow to find the inverse for a function algebraically. First, most important, is the function one-to-one? -one? Because if that answer is no, stop. You cannot find an inverse. If the answer is yes, then move on. Okay? Follow step two, three, four, and so on. But if the answer is no, no inverse exists. Okay? And if that's the case, just write that as your answer and you're done. 
Well, let's go through ones where they are one to one. So if a function is one to one, the next thing you're going to want to do, now that you determine you can find an inverse, is take the f of x out and put y in its place. Replace f of x with y. And once you do that, solve the new equation that you just created for x. After you do that, interchange the roles of x and y, which basically means wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a y. Wherever I see a y, I'm going to put an x. Once you do that, you basically have your inverse. Replace the y by f inverse of x, that notation that means inverse, and you have your inverse function. So let's look at an example. f of x equals 5 minus 3x over 2. So is this 1 to 1? Any way you want to figure that out is fine. It doesn't matter. But one thing you should look at is that this is a linear function, right? I could write this as 5 over 2 minus 3 over 2x. In that case, it's in that form of mx plus b. In this case, it's really b minus mx, but still, it's in that mx plus b form. So it's a line, right? And as long as it's not a horizontal line, right, because the horizontal line would be the only one that wouldn't pass the horizontal line test. As long as it's not a horizontal line, in this case it's a line that has a slope of negative 3 halves, which means it's a line that looks like this, it would always pass the horizontal line test and therefore it's one to one. I mean, question, is every linear function one to one? Well, the answer is no. Okay, There are linear functions that look like this. There are linear functions that look like this. Those would be one to one. But there's also the constant linear function that it looks like this. This is the one that's not one to one. So not every linear function is one to one, but if there's a slope, positive or negative, it's one to one. All right, so this is one to one. And again, I don't care how you determine whether or not something's one to one. We have different ways of doing it, looking at the graph, solving for x. They all do the same thing. So I think the easiest is if you know what the graph looks like, use that. So after you do that, okay, we determined it's one to one. Now we're going to say, all right, let's look at this. Step two, replace f of x with y. So y equals 5 minus 3x over 2. Okay. Step three. Solve this new equation now for x. So I'll multiply by 2. I'm going to have to subtract 5. Then I'll have to divide by negative 3. So I have 2y minus 5 divided by negative 3 equals x. Okay, That's solved for x. Step 4. Interchange the roles of x and y. So I'm going to write this as 2x minus 5 over negative 3 equals y. That, in turn, is really my inverse. So I'll replace my y with the f inverse notation. And there you go. There's my inverse. And I probably could write this answer a couple of ways, but generally, that's my inverse. So these five basic steps, I think the first one is the most important because that's going to determine whether or not you can do the other four is going to get you your inverse if you're trying to find an inverse. All right, let's do another one. So first off, find the inverse for this function. What do you do first? You have to say, is it one to one? Okay. Well, it's a cube root. Not only is it cube root, it's a cube root where I have a plus one inside. So generally my cube roots look like this. We talked about that earlier. Plus one inside means I should move it one unit to the left. So now it's going to look like this. Okay. Does that pass the horizontal line test? Well, if I put a horizontal line anywhere on here, it's only going to go through one point each time, so yes, it's one-to-one. -one. So now that I determined that it's one-to-one, -one, I'm going to move on. Step two, 
replace g of x with y, so I get y equals the cube root of x plus 1. Third step, solve for x. So I've solved for x, I get rid of the cube root. How? Cube both sides. Subtract 1. That's solve for x. Now, flip x and y, so I get x cubed minus 1 equals y. That's my inverse, so write it as an inverse x cubed minus 1. Now think about it. If I was to draw these two graphs, the first one we said is here and goes like this. Okay, That's the cube root. What's x cubed minus 1 look like? Well, that's a cube function down one unit. So it's here. So graphically, that looks like this. Now this is not the best picture by far, but if you think about this line that goes right here, should be the symmetry line. That y equals x line should be the symmetry line between the two graphs, and generally it is. So, you know, a lot of the things we talked about all kind of match up for this function. This function is the inverse of this function. Let's try one more. So if we look at this particular function here, let's see if we can find an inverse. So what's the first thing we should do? Is the function 1 to 1? And you say, okay, well, we looked at squares already. We determined that y equals x squared, in this case h of x equals x squared, is not 1 to 1. And you go, okay, well, if it's not 1 to 1, then it doesn't have an inverse. But there's a trick to this one. And this is going to be important. This is going to come up a lot uh, when you talk about trigonometric functions. So this is not just an x squared function. This is an x squared function where x is greater than or equal to 0. So if I think about that, I go, all right, well, here is my x squared function. But when is it greater than or equal to 0? Well, here's 0 for x, and that's greater than or equal to 0. So really what this function is is not the full u. It's not the full parabola. It's this piece of the parabola. So the question is, okay, does that piece of the parabola pass the horizontal line test? If I'm only looking at part of the function, is this part of the squaring function 1 to 1 is really what this is saying. This is not the pure squaring function. It's just part of the squaring function. And the idea is, if I look at it, it passes the horizontal line test the whole time. So the question is, is it 1 to 1? Well, actually, yes, it is. So if it is 1 to 1, it has an inverse. Now we need to find the inverse. But this concept of saying, all right, not every function is 1 to 1. And if it's not 1 to 1, it doesn't have an inverse. Well, that concept um, is important. But what we can do is we can say, for any function, if we just look at part of the function, we can always make any function 1 to 1 by doing that. And therefore, really, any function can have an inverse at some point but it would only have an inverse over part of it. Not the entire function, but part of the function would have an inverse. This is going to be a very important concept with trigonometric functions. But the idea for this one is purely what we just said. Now, whenever you do this, this is the domain of the function. Okay, You want that domain to be as big as possible so that the function is still one-to-one. -one. If you look at it, if I made this domain any bigger, I'm going to start looking at the function coming back up this way again. And the second my function starts coming back up this way, it's not going to pass the horizontal line test. So really, this is the biggest it could be and still make it one-to-one. -one. I could make it smaller. Like, I could just look at this little branch of the square function, and this piece right here is also one-to-one, -one, but it can get much bigger than that. This whole side is really a, the biggest piece of the squaring function that I could use and still make it one-to-one. -one. I could also look at the other branch. I could say, let's look at this branch. That would be for x is less than or equal to 0. Okay. So in this case, we just did greater than or equal to 0. All right, so now we want to find the inverse. Since it does exist, we want to find the inverse. So let's erase some of this and say, all right, well, step two. 
Replace h of x with y, so y equals x squared. Step three, solve for x. So solve for x, I get rid of the square, I take the square root. If I take the square root, remember, plus and minus. Anytime you take the square root of both sides of the equation, you have the plus and minus. But that's the problem. That is the issue with this thing not always having an inverse. You got that plus and minus. So that's where the domain's going to come in. If you look at this domain here, x is greater than or equal to 0. Well, right now, this statement says x equals a positive square root and x equals a negative square root. Well, if x has to be greater than or equal to 0, x has to be positive or 0. So this can't happen. It can't be negative. So I really don't have the plus and minus in this situation. Really what I have is that x equals the positive square root of y. Now, just an aside, what if I said x squared for x less than 0? Well, I would get to this step right here, and I would say, all right, well, if I get x equals plus and minus y, square root of y, x is less than or equal to 0. It means x is negative or 0, and I would want the negative one, and I wouldn't want the positive one. So therefore, x equals negative square root of y. So this domain part is really important, especially in trying to find your inverse. All right, let's go back to this problem. So we got that x equals the positive square root of y. Step 4 is replace x and y, so y equals the square root of x. Step 5 is that's my inverse. Okay, And think about it graphically. This is the branch of the parabola that we looked at. Okay, What does the square root function look like? Looks like that. Are they symmetric along this y equals x line? Yep. So y equals x squared and f of x equals, f inverse of x equals the square root of x are the inverse. And that should make sense in that they're the inverse of one another and they're the opposite operations for one another, which is kind of what inverses are all about. They go backwards. Now, it's not for the entire x squared function. It's just for x is greater than or equal to 0. But it is still the inverse function. So if you do this, if you restrict the domain of any function enough, right? if we look at this, if we restrict the domain of any function enough, okay? We can make any function one-to-one, -one, and therefore, technically, any function can have an inverse.